1 Samuel chapter 18 is where we are. 1 Samuel chapter 18 in your Bibles as we make our way through this book of 1 Samuel. Uh, we were introduced to Samuel the prophet. We've been introduced to Saul, the first king of Israel, and now the person who takes center stage really through much of the Bible from this point forward is David. I mean, even David is referenced a lot in the New Testament because Jesus is the son of David, because Jesus descended from the line of King David, which was all part of the Messianic prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. So David, the only David mentioned in the Bible, uh, is someone who as I said, kind of takes center stage here because uh, God is going to use him in a powerful way. He's a man just like you and I are. He has feet of clay. He um, sins. He uh, has victories. He has defeats. He has uh, times of joy and times of tears. He will write uh, three-fourths of the Psalms that we have in our Bible. The Psalms were songs, so he is both a poet and a songwriter, and he's also a warrior. He's a mixture of both the tender and the tough side of a man, and so he's got this great combination of being both, you know, sensitive, but also being very tough as a warrior, and we're going to see some of that warrior side of him uh, tonight as we go further into chapter 18, but let me pause and pray, and then we'll dive in where we left off. Lord, thank you for this time in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in our lives. Uh, Lord, we are needy people. We need more of you. Always, Lord, this is our prayer. Even as John the Baptist said, he must increase, meaning Jesus, that I might decrease. And we pray, God, that we would each decrease, Lord, and that you would increase in our lives, in our church, that you would be most exalted in everything, Lord. And we thank you for this time together in your word. We pray that you will use it to speak to us tonight, an ancient story with very timely application. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So uh, we, we finished chapter 17 last week and we had barely gotten into chapter 18. Chapter 17 is the famous uh, battle of David and Goliath. So I'm putting up on the screen behind me the Valley of Elah, which is where this battle transpired. This is an actual uh, picture from Israel, the Valley of Elah. And uh, David defeats Goliath. You know, it's been used in symbolic ways ever since to talk about the, the little guy defeating the big giant uh, in very figurative ways, but this was a literal story that literally happened. David was probably no more than 17 or so at the time. Uh, Goliath standing nine feet, nine inches, the Bible says, and with a simple sling and a stone, God behind the arm of David. Uh, David uh, flung the stone and um, Goliath dropped dead, and in order to make sure that he was actually dead and not just simply stunned by the stone, uh, David then took out Goliath's own sword from its sheath and cut off Goliath's head with Goliath's sword and kind of carried around as a little trophy for a little time. Uh, you know what 17-year-old doesn't want a trophy? Uh, this was at a time when trophies were only given when you actually won something. <laughs> And, um, and, so there, and so there David is, there David is with his trophy, the head of Goliath, and how huge would that have been from, you know, the frame of a nine foot, nine inch man, so you can only imagine. But um, that's where uh, chapter 17 ends, and Saul being so impressed as king of Israel at the time with young David's courage. David had the courage that the rest of the Israeli army did not have. No man wanted to go out and fight Goliath, but David did so, knowing it was in the strength of the Lord. You know, Saul then recruits David into his court, and Saul will then um, have David in a position where uh, Saul can keep his eye on him, because Saul becomes very threatened, very intimidated by David's success. Uh, Here Saul is, uh, a man probably at least in his late 50s at this point, and here's this 17-year-old punk who comes along and kills Goliath, and, and Saul literally uh, turns insane over this. Um, he wrestles with literally demons. 
I know we use that as an expression sometimes, or somebody, you know, is fighting their demons. I mean, this, this uh, and it can be literal, but in this case, uh, Saul is literally tormented. He's opened himself up to that torment, and God sends distressing spirits to torment Saul because of Saul's disobedience toward God. There's always a price to pay. The Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And when we transgress against God, we invite hardship in our lives, which, you know, is really something we should all be aware of because the world has enough hardships of its own that we will encounter even if we're not doing something sinful just because we live in a sinful world. So why would we want to add to that by disobeying God? And so Saul has added to his own hardship by disobeying God. And thus, God has allowed a distressing spirit. We're going to see that uh, in chapter 16. We already saw it. We're going to see it again here in chapter 18. And he invites this. And part of this tormenting, distressing spirit that um, plagues Saul is this desire then to eliminate David. Because Saul is so intimidated by David's success and David's courage and David's popularity. David becomes very popular with the nation of Israel that Saul will go to great lengths to literally kill him. And God protects David, but nevertheless, you can just see this, this man now who is Saul, who has been just absolutely plagued by insecurities, jealousy, envy, uh, anger, hatred, uh, all of this. And it's a very tragic story, as we've said in, in the course of going through this book. Saul gets off to a great start, but he doesn't finish well. And really, it, it doesn't matter as much what kind of a start you got. What matters is how well you finish. Uh, some of you came to Christ late in life. Some of you still don't know Christ. And so, you know, you're looking at your life and you think to yourself, well, I've done a lot of this and I've done a lot of that. And you wonder where there might be room in God's family for you. And the fact is, that no matter what you've done, no matter what your past, um, there's a point when you can come to Christ and have all that forgiven. And so it doesn't really matter the years in the past. What matters is going forward and how well that we finish. This is like running a race. This is why the Bible refers to Christianity. Uh, this, is not, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is a journey. This is a race. Run the race with perseverance that we might eventually then receive the prize and our internal in inheritance in the Lord. And so... Um, this is where we are. Now, at the beginning of chapter 18, I spent some time in our Bible study last Wednesday night, and I'm not going to go over it again, only to just mention that you see at the beginning of chapter 18 uh, a, a deep love, a deep friendship between Jonathan, the son of King Saul, and David. There's about a 20 to 30 age, uh, year age difference between the two of them. Um, and and yet I, I once read an article about uh, the significance of intergenerational friendships because the younger generation can glean something from the wisdom and experience of the older generation. The older generation can glean something from the innovation and uh, you know the new ideas and fresh perspectives of a young generation. And there seems to be here at least 20, perhaps as many as 30 years age difference between these two. And yet, again, as I mentioned last Wednesday, I just want to restate if you weren't here, yes, it does talk about a deep love that the two shared. It speaks about how they were knit together, their souls were knit, but this is nothing sexual. The, the gay community, the homosexual community has hijacked this. They have distorted the narrative. They want you to believe that these two had a homosexual relationship that just simply isn't true. I spent a lot of time last week dismantling that, so I'm not going to go through it again. You can listen last week as to why that does not make sense uh, regarding the text, okay? But be that as it may, it's an undeniable close male bonding that these two guys had. Remember, they're warriors. I mean, even though David is young and Jonathan is older, serving in the Israeli army, um, they have a deep mutual respect because they're both warriors. And, um, and so that's where we left off, chapter 18, verse 4. Let's pick it up there at verse 5. It says, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, again, bear in mind, he's not even of military age. You had to be over 20, to, according to Scripture, to serve in the Israeli army. But because he's had this great success in defeating Goliath with the power of the Lord, the strength and the help of God, he has acquired instant respect. 
You know, there's nothing like killing the biggest giant, your biggest adversary, to gain respect among your fellow Israelites. And so uh, Saul has put David in a position of authority here. And he has the respect with it. And so he's a warrior. Verse 6, now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. And so the women sang as they danced and said, here we go, Saul has slain his thousands, but listen, and David his ten thousands. Okay? Now listen, you know, nothing worse than, you know, having women who are, you know, these are two men. Okay, so Saul and David, nothing worse than being in a competition over who the women like the most, right? And so like David is 17 and the women are singing about him higher accolades than they are about the king of Israel. So they're like, well, Saul's killed his thousands. Yeah, but David... Well, that boy, he's, he's killed tens of thousands. Like, he's the real war he hero here. And so, you know, I just, I, I, I look at this story and I just think about how, you know, did that change David's strut a little bit? You know, all the women coming out dancing, singing about him. I don't know. But anyway, the Bee Gees sang about it. Um, but let's move on. No more dad jokes. Okay, so verse, but look what happened. Verse 8, then Saul was very angry because of this. He's jealous. And saying, and the saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Okay, so notice the suspicion sets in, the insecurity sets in. Verse 10, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God, here, here it is, this, this demonic presence, the, the, the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. Now, notice this again. This is a, a distressing spirit that God has allowed and um, this is... This is not a distressing spirit that God has conjured up. This is a distressing spirit that he has allowed. And, um, and it says Saul prophesied. Now, it doesn't mean it in the original language in the traditional sense of a prophet prophesying. The Hebrew can also mean uh, mumblings or ramblings. So um, that's in the context. There's this... God has allowed a demonic spirit to torment Saul, and as a result, he just starts rambling. He just starts mumbling. He just starts saying things that, that, that don't make uh, much sense. And so, next sentence, so David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. Hey, notice the contrast. There's, there's, there's a harp in David's hand. There's a spear in Saul's hand. And I, what I find interesting is when it concerns David, the same hand that slew a giant is the same hand that worships the Lord. So he's both a warrior and a worshiper. He knows who his enemy is. And in the name of the Lord, you know, David was the one who, who comes to uh, Goliath in the Valley of Elah. And he's the one who says, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of uh, hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so, you know, with this great courage, he, he goes up against the enemy, but he's also this just uh, very tender worshiper too. And so there he is playing worship because as he has done in the past, this normally will soothe Saul. And how many of you understand it's good to soothe somebody when they have a weapon in their hand? And so David knows, like, you know, I wonder if he's playing quickly, like, you know, Lord, help him, help him, Lord, help him, help him. Because, <laughs> because this guy's got a spear in his hand. And so, you know, David's probably strumming that, that heart pretty rapidly there. And so, and, so, um, and so it says in verse 11, and Saul cast the spear, notice, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice, twice. Now, you, you read some Bible commentaries and it says that it means actually that it wasn't just that Saul threw the spear once and missed and then threw it again. It kind of indicates that he threw once and missed. David went away, came back, 
And Saul tried it again. In other words, David, David wasn't intimidated by, by Saul because he trusted the Lord more than he was afraid of, of Saul's um, manic state here. Uh, well, verse, the next verse, verse 12 says, now Saul was afraid. Notice this. He was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. I'll come back to that in a moment, but just kind of notice that. The Lord was with David, and the Lord had departed from Saul. Verse 13, therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. You know, he, he promotes David here. He commissions him. You're a captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. That last phrase just simply means he went out to war and then he came back, went out to war and he came back. A couple of principles, we've been looking at different principles through these chapters and, and uh, here's the first one. Uh, number one, when provoked, don't retaliate, hold your peace. I love the way that David just responds in a very calm way to the attack here. He doesn't retaliate. Uh, Saul tries to kill him. He doesn't, you know, take the spear that Saul uh, tried to kill him with but missed and chuck it back at Saul. You know, he, he holds his peace. He doesn't retaliate. This is an important discipline that we need to understand. And I hope and pray that all of us, if you're a believer in Jesus, will ask for the same spirit of Jesus to be able to hold your tongue and to hold your reactions and your responses when necessary. Because I'm sure all of us at some point can testify to the fact that when we try to retaliate because we think it'll make us feel better, it actually makes things worse. And, and we usually end up in a worse situation than if we had just bit our tongue and walked away. That's what David does. He just bites his tongue and he walks away. You know, it, it, Isaiah the prophet, when he spoke about Messiah prophetically, writing about Jesus in Isaiah 53, 7, Isaiah said that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Remember when Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate, he didn't try to defend himself. He didn't try to retaliate. He didn't open up his mouth. He just let God defend him. And, of course, the Bible reminds us in Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so we have to learn to trust God with the people who might be after us or the people who might be accusing us falsely or the people who might be, you know, gossiping about us or the people who, you know, might be trying to afflict us in some way or malign us. You know, there's only so much you can do. And then you start to look like, you know, you're just defending yourself. And then, and then that looks small. And, and it's better to let the person who's trying to do what they're trying to do look smaller by just not responding and not retaliating. Praying sometimes, you know, somebody said this to me years ago and it's come in handy and I, I've recalled it many times. Pray it, don't say it. <laughs> like in the moment when you want to say it, you just bite your tongue till it bleeds and you pray through it. You pray it, you don't say it. And I love this about David. He has this restraint you know, anybody can just go off. Anybody can do that. But it takes a man or a woman with courage and self-discipline to restrain yourself so that you don't retaliate and you let God handle things. Now, that isn't to say that you never stand up for yourself. That isn't to suggest that you never uh, need to sometimes correct the record. Um, but what I'm talking about is this need that sometimes we have to just get even or to, you know, uh, for the sake of like, you know, making sure everybody likes us and doesn't believe this person that we, you know, end up trying to say something or retaliate in a way that really does us more harm than good. So let's learn self-restraint. When provoked, don't retaliate, hold your peace. The other thing here that I see is how it mentions twice, verse 12, now Saul was afraid of David, and again in verse 15, therefore when Saul saw that he behaved, David behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. What would the king have to be afraid of, of like a teenager for? Like, wh why would you be afraid of this guy? Except that verse 12 is really where his fear comes from. The Lord was with David, but the Lord had departed from Saul. 
And that's where he felt very insecure, and that's why he was afraid of David. And so, just kind of a simple little mathematical equation, everything minus the Lord equals nothing, but nothing plus the Lord equals everything. Saul, think about this, Saul had the kingdom, he had power, he had an army, he had wealth, he had everything going for him, humanly speaking, but he didn't have the Lord. The Lord had departed from him because Saul was disobedient to God. And so the one thing that David had, because he didn't have the kingdom yet, even though he had been anointed as the next king of Israel, wasn't his time. He didn't have the kingdom. He didn't have wealth. He, he didn't have anything, but he had the Lord, which means he had everything. The Lord was with David, but the Lord had departed from Saul. And that's why Saul was a man who was paranoid and fearful of David. Well, read on, verse 17, then Saul said to David, here is my older daughter, Merab. Now, remember that one of the things that King Saul promised the soldier who defeated Goliath, one of the things he promised, remember, was his daughter's hand in marriage. King Saul said, I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage, I'll give you great riches, and I'll exempt you from taxes. And so now, Saul is going to try to make good on his word. We see it goes sideways, but here's, here's how it goes. Here's my older daughter, Merab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Now, here's, here's where we're heading with Saul. And you're going to see a few more examples besides this one. Saul realizes... I can't seem to kill this guy. You know, I'm throwing spears at him and the kid doesn't die and he just, you know, evades everything I, I try to do to kill him. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try to kill him. I'm just going to thrust him into battle and I'm going to let the Philistines kiss, kill him. And so this is his plan now. He's strategizing. He's conniving, Saul is. And he's thinking, how can I eliminate David but without myself having to kill him? So here's what I'm going to do. You can have my daughter, Merab, but you got to go into battle and fight the Philistines. Well... Here's what happens. Verse, uh, verse 18, so, so David said to Saul, well, who am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? I mean, David's just genuinely just kind of humble. He's like, you know, I, I don't even really deserve this and I'm going to fight for Israel regardless if you ever really give me your daughter. So, you know, I just kind of defer back to you. And it says, but it happened at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David that she was given to Adriel, the Meholothite, as a wife. And so Saul goes back on his word. Now, there's another daughter. Saul has two daughters. Merab is one. Michal is another. And so here comes verse 20. Now, Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. So you get the idea that Merab really didn't. She loved this other guy, Ariel, and so, Adriel. And so, so those two get married. And here comes Michal, Saul's other daughter. She loved David. And they told Saul... And the thing pleased him. And so Saul said, I will give her to him. Notice that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. And therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law. Now, how is it that Michal will potentially be a snare to David? That's the word that Saul uses. You know, I'm gonna, okay, I'm going I'm to let her get married to David because she'll be a snare to him. So you read different Bible commentaries, and here's basically the two schools of thought there. One school of thought is that and we find out later about Michal. Her character is not that wonderful. I mean, she's not that devoted to God because she... Um, she barks at David about a few things, and I don't want to get ahead of the story. If you know, we'll, we'll get to it later. Um, and so it could be that Saul's like, you know, I know my daughter, been living with her and raising her, and she ain't no party. And uh, if I give her to David, uh, he's going to be miserable. So how about that? I'll just, uh, I'll kill him with my daughter. So go ahead. So that's one thought. That's probably not the, the best interpretation. What's probably better is we find here in a little bit that even though Saul has promised as a reward uh, one of his daughter's hand in marriage to the guy who kills Goliath, he didn't necessarily mean free. I'll make a commitment, you can marry her, but you're still going to have to pony up the dowry. Now, in those days, a dowry, without exaggeration, was basically alimony in advance. That's really in that culture what dowry was, because as a woman, if, if a man left you and deserted you or divorced you, 
you could become destitute. And so a dowry was paid to the bride's family. So in the event that the husband ever left or abandoned or divorced her, there would be a source of uh, supply for her to um, help support her and, and, and provide for her. And so Saul is going to ask David for a dowry that could end up jeopardizing his life. And we're going to see here. And it's kind of a, I'll tell you in advance, it's a very unusual dowry, let's just say that. And so, and so here we go. And so it says in, in verse, uh, verse 22, and Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become the king's son-in-law. Come on, marry the girl. And so Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor and lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner David spoke. So he, they report back to Saul. And then Saul said, here's the dowry, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but, here it is, here's the dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Okay? Like I said, unusual, right? But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Okay? So you get the idea. He's like, you know, what's a good way to jeopardize David's life and to make some Philistines really, really mad that they might want to kill him? I know. I'll tell him to go get the the foreskins off a hundred Philistines and bring them to me. I don't know, like in a Ziploc baggie, I don't really know. It's probably inappropriate to make any jokes at this place, so I'm, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. All right, so, but anyhow, oh, come on. I'm gonna put the fun back in fundamentalism, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so, so here we go. So this is, David's, this is David's request, this is the dowry. All right, and verse, uh, next verse, verse 26. So when his servants said David, to, uh, told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. And therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed not 100, but 200 men of the Philistines. David's like, I'll see your 100 and I'll raise you 200 foreskins. <laughs> and he's going to kill 200 of them. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full count to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. And then what it, Saul had no other recourse, and Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. Like, wow, I'm impressed. Now, but seriously, here's the reason why um, Saul did this. It's, again, it's another conniving plot to try to get David killed, because David has to at least, at least by Saul's request, you have to kill 100 Philistines first. So that alone will obviously enrage the Philistines. But now you're going to, in the minds of the Philistines, mutilate their bodies. And in mutilating their bodies, you're also going to be putting upon them the mark of circumcision, which is identifying these heathen pagan people as the mark that God has made in covenant with the Jewish people. So you are in effect, in a few different ways, you're angering the Philistines because you're killing a hundred of their soldiers. You are in the Philistines' minds mutilating their flesh and you're putting on them the mark of the covenant that identified them as Jewish. So this is in every way offensive to the Philistines and Saul is hoping this will be enough to enrage the Philistines to capture and kill David. It doesn't work. David goes above and beyond the request for the dowry, brings to Saul what he does, and Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as his wife. And thus, thus Saul, thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. And so Saul became David's enemy continually. Notice this. And then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteemed. So again, there's that constant theme where David just behaves wisely. Uh, he has the wisdom of God. He is a warrior. He goes out and he fights. By the way, even today in the Israeli army, in the Israeli Defense Force, in the IDF, the Israelis are one of very few nations in the world where generals still go out on the front line to fight. 
in battle. And so, even though David is this anointed next king, successor to Saul, that doesn't change anything. He's going to be right on the front line, and he's going to be engaged in battle wherever he can as this valiant warrior for God. Let's go into chapter 19. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Look at this. He's just, he's just unabashed about it now at this point. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. And so Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you, and then what I observe, I will tell you. And so, you know, Jonathan again has, um, would normally have been successor to the throne, except that God had determined to take it from Saul's family and give it to David. And, and Jonathan doesn't have any issues, any insecurities here. He, he loves David. He, he's not intimidated or threatened by him. And, he, and because of his sincere friendship with David, he wants to do everything he can to protect this guy. Now, his father's a maniac now at this point. His dad wants to kill David, and Jonathan is intercepting this and trying to fight and defend David, fight for David and defend David. And so, verse 4, thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant. This is bold to confront your dad, the king, like this. Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he, was not, he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands. And killed the Philistine, meaning Goliath. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Now, Jonathan is literally taking his own life in his own hands. Because the way that Saul has become so unpredictable and so demonized, he could have likely killed his son for confronting him like this. Twice Jonathan says, don't sin. You're going to sin against God if you take David's life. And Saul, at least for the moment, is receptive to what Jonathan says. Verse 6, and so Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan and Saul swore. He took an oath. And he says, is, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. And so Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So for the moment, at least, Saul is okay with David coming back into his service, and he's not going to try to kill him. It won't last for very long, but for the moment, there's kind of a truce. And it says in verse 8, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit, here we go again, the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand, same scene again. And here we go, though. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence. And he drove the spear into the wall, and so David fled and escaped that night. So it doesn't last very long. Um, Saul will continue to hunt David down for roughly the next 15 years. And God will continue to protect him. But this is what it says, verse 11, Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So, you know, you have both the kids of King Saul. You have his son, Jonathan, and you have his daughter, Michal, who are defending David here. Like, you know, he's this innocent guy who's just uh, trying to be hunted down by a madman. And so Michal is saying to him, you, you got you to gotta save your life tonight uh, or tomorrow you're going to die. And so verse, verse 12, and so Michal let David down through a window and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head, <laughs> and covered it with clothes. And so when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And so, you know, there's this picture, I don't know if you ever saw the movie, it's a long time ago, Escape from Alcatraz. And, you know, this is what those guys did. You know, they pretended to put 
you know, uh, puppets, basically, you know, human puppets uh, in the bed. So when the guards came along, they thought they saw them lying there. Actually, they had tunneled their way out of, of, the, of their prison cells. And so, you know, this is the kind of thing that McCall is doing for David, like making this human puppet, this image with and taking goat's hair and putting it on the head and making it look like David is in bed. And she's like, shh, he's, he's sick, he's sick. And so they, they take a glance and not realizing that the whole thing is a setup. And so they they go away. And um, then Saul, verse, verse 15, then Saul sent the messengers back to see David saying, well, I don't care if he's sick, like bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. Like, I'll, I'll do this myself. Just bring the whole bed and, and the sick boy with him. And verse 16, and when the messengers had come in, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. And then Saul said to McCall, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And McCall answered Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? So she's a good liar uh, because she's lied twice here. You know, she's like, oh, he's in bed. He's sick. No, he's not. Um, and now she's saying, well, the reason why you know, I let him go is because he threatened to kill me. So I, I had to let him go, daddy. You know, and... Uh, and, and daddy's buying it for the moment. Um, so, you know, she's, she's a little conniving uh, person too, kind of like, like father, like daughter. And so David fled and escaped and went to Samuel. This is the prophet Samuel. We haven't heard from him in a long time. Went to Samuel at Ramah. That was where Samuel lived. And told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Uh, here's principle one from chapter 19. When in distress, seek godly counsel. Uh, David, you know, David had a relationship with the Lord, so it's not like Samuel as the prophet was a substitute for his relationship with the Lord. We should never look to other people. To, we should never look to a pastor or a counselor or any other mentor as uh, taking the place of the Lord. We should have that kind of a relationship with the Lord first. But it certainly is a valuable addition when you have somebody like Samuel, who's a prophet of the Lord, to go to and to seek counsel. And David goes to Samuel. And he, and he says to Samuel, this is what's happened, this is what's transpired, you know, I, I'm sure that conversation went something like this, Saul has tried to kill me many times, you know, what have I done? You know, I just, I just tried to, you know, follow the Lord and this guy's trying to kill me and, and McCall lowered me down out of a window, I've escaped and I've run down to see you, what should I do? And so he's seeking godly counsel, there's a place for that. You know, there's a place in, in our times of distress to seek godly counsel, um, and, and the value of, you know, especially mentors and people in our lives who uh, are, are, you know, solid in the Lord and can keep a confidence and can pray for you and encourage you and give you scripture. I mean, this is, this is a good thing. And David has sought the prophet of Israel. He sought Samuel. And so Samuel and David went and stayed at Naoth. So Samuel probably perceived here, like, you know, Saul will likely figure out perhaps that you've come to see me and everybody knows I live in Ramah, so let's go on up to, go off to Naoth for the time. And verse 19 says, now it was told Saul saying, take note, David is at Naoth in Ramah. So word is already spread. And then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. Now, your attention here for a moment. Samuel was the leader of, in those days, something that was known as the school of the prophets. You, you see Elijah and Elisha also, you'll see later, they were a part of the school of the prophets. There was actually a, a school, a training center, where uh, men who uh, felt the calling of God would sit under the, the, the tutelage and instruction and mentorship of other godly prophets. And, um, and, and, and so Samuel has a school, a school of the prophets. And so I want you to picture like young men here who are a part of this school and Saul sends messengers, like find out where David is and what's going on. And again, he's just trying to find where he is so he can, so he can kill him. And 
the messengers go to Samuel. They see Samuel leading these groups of prophets, the school of prophets. These guys are prophesying. And the Spirit of God comes upon the messengers that Saul sent. And they also prophesied. Now, in the strictest sense of the word, a prophet was not really someone who predicted the future. A lot of times we think that's what prophecy is. It is foretelling. Sometimes it did involve that as God would speak to the prophet about some impending doom or danger or something that was coming in, in Old Testament times. But more often than not, prophecy just means forthtelling, not foretelling. Forthtelling, declaring the counsel of God or the wonders of God. Now, this is kind of an interesting place we are here in 1 Samuel because on Sundays we're in the book of Acts. We've been talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, two Sundays ago we talked about Pentecost. Last Sunday we talked specifically about the gift of tongues in the context of, of the day of Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is a unique thing that is happening here that was not repeated as a pattern. What do I mean? You're going to see here that people came under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit who were not seeking the Holy Spirit, who were not seeking God. They just were suddenly met by the power of God. So when it says that they were prophesying, yes, they were overwhelmed with some uh, understanding from God and, and the Word of God, and they began to speak forth the Word of God, but this is not a pattern that is duplicated, like all of a sudden, you know, unbelievers or people who aren't seeking God will suddenly, you know, come under the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a unique thing, and it doesn't just happen once, it happens four different times in the rest of this chapter. Take a look. The Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Verse 21. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. That's group number two. And then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also, group three. And then he also went, he himself, Saul, he also went to Ramah. He's like, well, I'm going to go see for myself. He also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Seku. He So he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at Naoth in Ramah. And so he went there to Naoth in Ramah. And then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and laid down naked all day and all night. Don't get any ideas, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Don't get any ideas. L laid down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? All right, now, this is an unusual thing. We only have a couple minutes, and I'll summarize this, and then we'll, we'll pray and call it a night. But here's what's going on here. Again, a very unusual manifestation of God's Spirit in this way. Not to fill people who were seeking, but really as an indication to them that you just can't come after David without God's permission. And this was God's way of interrupting their plans, which were contrary to God's plans, because these groups of messengers intended harm for David, and so what God did by His Spirit was actually protecting David by interfering with their plans to harm David. That's why they came under the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, you know, not until Acts chapter 2 is the Spirit of God poured out upon all flesh, upon believers in Jesus. But the Holy Spirit was poured out on assignment at different times in the Old Testament. And this particular unique scene where three different groups and then a fourth occasion with Saul himself come under the power of the Holy Spirit, what it's really teaching us here is, this is the second principle, that God will humble us under His power when we, when we oppose His plans. You see, when, Dave, when, when Saul, rather, when Saul comes into Samuel's presence and the Spirit of God falls on him also, he's undone. Do you remember when Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, comes into the presence of the Lord and Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am a man 
of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Like he was instantly aware of his own sinful condition and he wondered how could God use me as a prophet to the nations seeing as how I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. You know, we are, we are deceitful, lying, sinful people. How could God use me? And he was undone in the presence of God. That's what's happening here in a similar way. Saul is undone in God's presence. It's not that all of a sudden he had this wonderful conversion and now he's filled with the Spirit and he's back to being wonderful King Saul again. Here's the problem with Saul that we need to all be aware of because we can always learn from somebody whether they were a good example to emulate or a bad example to avoid. Saul is a bad example in that he was a very unspiritual man who could be very spiritual when he wanted to. The issue for all of us is to be spiritual men and women on a consistent basis because our hearts are devoted to God. Not just because of these one-off moments when God gets our attention because literally we're going against the plan of God and he's coming upon us in his power to humble us. That's what he's doing here with Saul. He's humbling Saul. And, and by the way, the language here in the Hebrew does not necessarily mean he's stripped to being completely naked. It can also just mean he's stripped down to his underwear, but he's just lying on his face before God. He's undone, and he feels completely humble in this moment, a very unspiritual man who can be spiritual when he needs to be, but unfortunately not on a consistent basis. May God help us to be consistently men and women who love the Lord and want to walk after him. Learn from Saul. He's got some things we can learn not to do, He's a man who's very duplicitous in his nature. And God wanted to show him, you just can't come in here and do to David whatever you want. My power's at work to protect him and to humble you. That's the end of chapter 19. We'll pick it up there next week. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these different reminders to us as well because there are many things that we can learn from men and women of the Bible that can speak to us in different ways. I pray, God, in whatever way you've spoken to us tonight, we would take these things home. We would meditate on these things, Lord, as you would instruct us by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that you're patient with us. You're so gracious toward us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us and gave your son Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. And everybody said, amen.